Good morning everyone and welcome to a very promising and slightly drier start to the Sunrise Safari. I'm very very excited for the morning that we have planned up ahead. For those of you who don't know, my name is Jamie and I have jean on camera with me this morning. And driving around on Wendy is Scott and Viam the Wildebeest. And it's so nice to see the sun finally peeking through. Very very exciting stuff. Now, yesterday evening, if you weren't watching the sunrise safari, or the sunset safari, Via and I were sitting in an elephant sighting when all of a sudden two little hyena cubs popped out. And we knew that we had to be very, very close to the den because it was one of the, small, the smallest cub, the youngest cub, had come to investigate both the elephants and our noise and had come to say hello. And they led us straight back to this termite mound that is off to my left which is where they have moved their den site to. Now, I've just pulled in slowly, I've just arrived. So far I haven't seen any hyena, but the entrance that they use is just on the other side. So let us head round and see. But that's one of the amazing things about these live safaris, is you just never know what to expect. You can be sitting in an elephant sighting and all of a sudden, a load of hyena cubs pop out to come and say hello. It was very definitely a nice surprise for us last night. And not only are we live, but we are interactive. So if you guys are new viewers, let us know, please. We'd love to hear from you. And you can also send through any questions that you might have, and you can do that on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. We do love to hear from you. And the questions are definitely one of my favorite parts of these safaris because it gets us thinking about things that we wouldn't necessarily have thought of without them. Let's scoot around here and see if there's any action out and about. Hello little one, he's just a nose popping out. Give me a moment and I'll be able to show you too. They've picked, as VM said, they've moved to a nice neighborhood. <laughs> Definitely stepping up in the world. It's a nice open den, so you can't get too close, which I think might even have been their intention. Lots of logs around to protect it. Here we go, we've just got one little nose sticking out there. Good morning. And that looks like the youngest cub to me now. Cannot believe how it's grown since we last saw them. It's looking very, very stocky and solid. And apparently rather sleepy this morning. Just sniffing the air. It was this little one that ultimately led us to this den site. Such amazing news. <laughs> Interestingly, yesterday when I was with these hyena cubs, I only counted three of them. I'm hoping there's a fourth one around as well. Now for those of you who are joining us a little bit late and you haven't been following the progress of this hyena clan, there is one older cub who was born late December and there's two younger ones, two siblings, and they were born in February and then this little one who was absolutely minuscule and only a couple of weeks old when I started working at Wild Earth in July. The rate that hyena cubs grow is absolutely phenomenal. Their mothers have some of the
most protein rich milk in all of the mammals out here. And this little one's had a good start in life. Oh, you gonna, yep. Heading down to investigate. Definitely the youngest cub. Look how spotty he's got since we last saw him. You'll notice that I have been quite gender neutral while I've been talking about these cubs. And that's because we're still in the process of figuring out males and females. It's very difficult with hyena, especially at this age. James and I both thought this was a female, but I'm sure one of the other presenters mentioned that they thought it might be a male. And I think we're just going to have to wait and see as time goes on. This is exciting news not only for us but also for the rest of the guides. So one thing I'm going to do now is call in the hyena den and let them know exactly where it is. Morning stations, I've relocated active Misikaya. It is maybe a hundred meters south of the fire break on the western side of Aubrey's Road. Hmm. My announcement was met, met with silence at the moment. I know that Andrew was interested in seeing them, so I'm going to try and contact him directly. Andrew, Andrew? Morning, Andrew. Are you interested in coming to the Misikaya? It's quite far north on Aubrey's Road, it's about 50 meters in, but you'll see where my tracks go off-road. I'm here now. Copy that, no problem. If you aren't here by the time I leave, I'll leave a quarry branch or something in the road for you. Here we go, just letting him know how to find this place. And these hyena cubs are just too cute to sh not to share. <laughs> so from a little hyena at its den site to a lilac breasted roller in a hole in a tree and its little nesting site for the upcoming breeding season. Let's head across to Scott and see what he's found and I'll catch up with you a little bit later. Welcome back everyone. Well actually welcome for the first time shall I rather say. And we found another den site. It's very different to the hyena den that you're currently sitting at. And this is a beautiful bird called a lilac breasted roller poking its head out of its nesting cavity isn't this awesome we've just seen it crawl in and I wonder what its next move will be well isn't it wonderful that we've got off to such a great start Jamie at the hyena den and myself and Viam, who I'm teamed up with this morning, found this new nest site. I love finding the birds' nests, which are plentiful at this time of the year. 
And this one's going to be very easy to monitor. It's on Cheetah Katla, just north of our southern boundary. And we came here looking for lion, but we haven't found them yet. But what we have found is this little interesting sighting that we couldn't resist sharing with you. Look at the colors here. Absolutely awesome. Wow. Great stuff. And we're not going to keep you here too long. We will send you back to Jamie now that this very pretty bird has moved out of its nest. But for those of you who have never met me before, I'm Scott and it's good to be on safari with all of you this morning. We're going to continue north up Cheetah Cut Line checking for any sign of lion coming back into Juma or any other interesting animals along the way. But we are desperate to try and work out what's going on with the lion in this area. There's been a huge amount of change in dynamics over the last few weeks and months and look forward to trying to get you into the right position to see a few more events unfold. Like I said, though, we're going to send you back to Jamie as we continue our search. So, see you later. Welcome back. And the wonderful thing about this springtime season is all the babies that we get to see, including this little one. Now, I think it's chewing on the hoof that we saw it with yesterday in the Sunset Safari. I believe that the hyena ran north into Buffles Hook a couple of days ago and dragged back part of that buffalo kill that the Birmingham boys had. I think that was maybe about five days ago. I tend to lose track of time out here, but that's probably where that hoof came from. Now, because... There are a couple of older cubs who will be supplementing their diet quite heavily with meat from kills. The mothers are dragging bits back to the den site more regularly. And that also tends to give the hyena den site a certain pungent aroma. Which I'm not smelling too badly yet. They obviously haven't been here long enough for that smell to accumulate. Oh, itchy ear. Heard some hippos off at Sydney's Dam. It's hard to believe that this is the same hyena cub that we were looking at only a couple of weeks ago. And Angie, I know, that was used to be that little dark, chubby, clumsy furball starting to get his or her adult colouring already. It really is quite phenomenal. It's hard to believe how fast this little one has grown. It's quite impressive to think and it's, I've noticed wandering around how stocky it's looking as well really stocky and solid and before when we saw it right in the beginning when we saw him it was full of wrinkles and skin that looked far too big for his body now oh, looking a bit more like a hyena still feeling a little bit shy though tucked away but yes, Lucy, who is from South Bend, Indiana, welcome to the Sunrise Safari. I'm also thrilled that we've managed to relocate this hyena den. I'd like to be able to claim credit for it, but really it was just pure luck. And <laughs> the hyena cubs actually found us in the end. But still fantastic news and very, very exciting. And I like this den site that they moved to. Is slightly more open than the one at Gallagher Shortcut, although we are only probably about 700 meters away from that old den, if that. 
they haven't moved terribly far. But I think for them this is definitely a far better site. I mentioned yesterday that that old den site on Gallego Shortcut was right next to a drainage line. Very tucked away in dense vegetation and I think, I suspect, that when we had that heavy rain about two, just over two weeks ago, I have a suspicion that that den became a little bit waterlogged by water draining into that drainage line. So I think the hyenas made a sensible decision in moving out into this open area. It's a little bit higher up. So the soil will be a little bit more drained. Whoop, what's happening? <laughs> I wonder what is spotted. Just sniffing the air, I think. Oh. Going to go investigating. Peering hard off into a direction. Maybe hopeful that mom is going to come back and provide some food. I need to reposition. There's something very interesting happening with the hyenas off to my right. I'm going to try and get us in without disturbing them. As I mentioned before, it's quite thick. Let's see if we can manage this. That's what that cub was looking at. I wondered why he was glancing so intently in that direction. Let's see what these hyenas are up to. One thing about this den site is it does involve 20 point turns at all approaches. Let me see how we're going to do this. It's going to be a little bit tricky, but let's go around this way. position to get us a view. We had a question from Rosanna about the hyena breeding season. Well welcome Rosanna to the Sunrise Safari. It depends on the conditions of the female. They don't have a set breeding time of year although it's not uncommon for females of the clan to have their babies around the same time just because then you can invest You've got more members investing their attention on protecting the den. And usually a mother, a hyena mother will breed roughly once a year or once every two years usually having about two cubs at a time. Hello hyena, sorry. Here we go, we've got lots of individuals. What you up to little one? Good morning. Good morning. Not the wheel, please. <laughs> they are such curious little things. They always come up and say hello and try and sniff the tires. But quite often that sniffing of tires involves taking a chunk out of them. They have to be watched very, very closely. Here we go, we've got one of the older cubs. Now, yesterday evening I had a question about how big the hyena are and sort of compared to a dog breed that people might know. But have a look now with us, with the hyena next to our vehicle. I'm putting them at roughly the, roughly the height of a large German Shepherd dog, but they're much bulkier. You can see how huge that head looks. 
just being curious, coming to say good morning. Now, an adult female hyena can reach up to 60 kilograms, which is about 120 pounds. <laughs> it's coming to say good morning to you, Jandre. <coughs> what you doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> they really are absolutely the most wonderfully entertaining animals. Oh, goodness. Is that scary? Shame. <laughs> coming to investigate. That's actually an older... That's probably a sub-adult cub who came to say good morning. Just reached adulthood and is sniffing away at the rest we've got. Look how many hyena we've got. Six of them all crowded round. Oh, good. We have got all the cubs. I was worried yesterday. But there we go. Here comes the third of the older cubs. That's good news. It's very, very good news. Oh, look at that! An entire warthog head! marching away with it like a prize that is so in interesting it's the first time I've ever seen a hyena wandering around with a full-on warthog head what this is what's so important about finding an active den site is you just get to see all of this activity A bit of clan dynamics happening there. Making sure the cubs know their place. And we've seen regularly, we've seen these cubs get quite considerably bullied. They're making those squealing, begging noises. Oh, just got a whiff of the warthog head as well. Look at them go. <laughs> See those tails up as a sign of excitement. This is all very gentle. It doesn't look gentle when we see those large teeth. Oh, shame. Oh. Trying to get away from the attentions of the younger adults. Let me shift around and reposition and as I do that let me once again call in on the radio to let them know what's happening at the hyena den. But let's get a view of them in the warthog head. Very interesting. Um, pungent. Well, hold on. I said warthog originally. I'm rethinking. That's not a warthog. That's a that part of a hippo. I think that might be a hippo mouth. Looks like it. Looks like the front end of a hippo. A young hippo, obviously a baby. And that is interesting. That's very interesting. I wonder how they got hold of a hippo. It's not impossible that they kill the baby by themselves. There's quite a lot of, there's quite a few adults and it is possible. We tend to forget 
maybe if you're new to the idea of spotted hyenas, that they're actually very, very efficient hunters. <laughs> no, I think... No, it is still a warthog. It is definitely still a warthog. Seeing its face now when they've picked it up, it's definitely a slightly decomposed warthog. <laughs> Running around with it like a prize. <laughs> oh, mom's up to sort things out. They've got too close to her baby. Oh, hyenas running everywhere. And then just one cub still remaining. Oh, fun things about filming hyenas. They're all over the place. There's lots of activity. We can hear them vocalizing like that. I'm hoping that they're going to come back. I can't reposition at the moment just because we've got so many visitors around the vehicle. This particular individual is very curious this morning. Coming right up to say hello. Accompanied by a wet dog smell, which combines beautifully with the smell of the warthog head. Ooh, birds are so noisy this morning. Those are the magpie shrikes you can hear. They've all moved out from around us, so let's reposition once again and see if we can get a nice clear view of them, what they've been up to. As I said, this den site is the place of 20 point turns. But while I do that, I mentioned earlier trying to compare hyena to a sort of domestic breed of dog to get a size reference. And Neil, you were wondering if they're in the dog family, if hyena fall into the dog family. And interestingly enough, no they don't. They might look canine-ish. They've got that look about them with their feet and the way their legs are structured. But in fact, they are neither part of the dog nor the cat family. It's a completely separate family, known as Hyena Day. Evolutionary-wise, probably closer to cats, just a little bit in terms of their evolutionary history, but that doesn't make them cats. It just means that they're that much closer in terms of their evolutionary line. Here we go, we've got most of them again in a nice open patch. The three cubs are looking nice and healthy, the three older ones. One of them is noticeably smaller than the others. There's a good chance that that one that's in the middle of the three cubs is a, is a male. Just looking at size comparison. And for those of you who don't know, with hyena, the males are mu the females are much much bigger than the males and I'll carry on that conversation topic in a moment I just want to hop onto the game drive channel Aubrey for Jamie morning orbs yeah this Misika is very active there's all former Pimpano out a couple of the adults as well uh, there's space for at least two movers here Good morning. Hey guys, coming through. Aubrey's just asking for directions. 
I'm about maybe 100 meters south of the fire break on the western side of Aubrey's Road. You'll see where my tracks go off road. <laughs> We've just got little patches of fur sticking up on the other side of the vehicle. <laughs> All coming to say hello and investigate. They are such entertaining little animals. Now I mentioned that I thought, bear with me as I keep looking at them out of the corner of my eye to make sure I don't lose the rubber cap that sits in the middle of the wheel. They love that. It makes for a perfect chew toy. So Andre, just keep an eye on the mischievous things that are around us. But I mentioned that females are much, much bigger and you start to see that even at the young age that these middle cubs are at. So even at seven months old, you can start to see the size discrepancy. And it's probably only the, the one and only truly matriarchal society that we get out here, or animal social system. Because they, the females are completely dominant. They're bigger, they have very high levels of testosterone. And no matter what rank a female has within the clan, and they do have a very strict hierarchy system, no matter what rank they are in the clan, they're still going to be higher than the highest ranking male of the area. So what will happen is we'll get den sites like this where you get all of the individuals coming through to visit and with babies as well. And the females who don't have cubs will pop in every now and again and they'll all not necessarily be related to each other but there is a much stronger chance. So you'll get maybe one or two matriarchal lines within a clan. So unrelated females and their offspring. And then a couple of unrelated males who come through every now and again and look for a sneaky chance to mate with the females. And it is quite a tricky business because the females tend to be quite aggressive towards incoming males. Oh, hyenas everywhere. What are you guys doing? I get the, I get the distinct impression there's about to be teeth involved around the area of my wheel well which makes me slightly nervous it's not unheard of for them to have a chew and if you think about it they're very very intelligent animals so they're investigating the world around them with the only mechanism they have which is teeth guys I'm just just going to Aubrey if you come from the fire break south on Aubrey's road if you go maybe 50 meters down the road, you should get my tracks going off to the west, into the block. Just directing Aubrey in. He's struggling to find us. I'm not sure if that's his audio. It doesn't sound like it. That sounds like a tractor to me. I will finish my thought in a moment. Yeah, at the moment they're not all at the den site, so we could have three vehicles here. One at the den and then two more with the rest of them, just off to the north of the den. It is quite a thick block. Okay, now where was I? Just chatting a little bit about hierarchies within hyena clans. Now, Lisa G, good morning, welcome to the Sunrise Safari. You were wondering if we have the matriarch who has then passed on her high status to a cub, such as we suspect with that little cub, with the youngest cub. Now, if we have that kind of scenario and the matriarch is killed, what happens then to the cub at that sort of age? Because she's inherited her mother's status, but now her mother's no longer there to defend and keep that status going. 
Now, in that particular circumstance, there is a chance that that cub would be slightly lower ranking than it would normally be if the mother was alive. It depends, of course, as well as if it survives. Um, there's a chance that it could, but probably not. The hyena are n not really likely, the other mothers around the den site, they're less likely to really look after it or invest any time and will probably actually start to bully it without the mother's defense. And so there's a good chance that if the mother was killed at the age of the youngest cub, that little cub would probably die. For the older cubs, the twins and then the slightly older, uh, that we suspect is a male cub, if their mothers were to die, they're probably at the age where they stand a much higher chance of survival. Now a lot of our hyenas have just disappeared off. They've melted into the bushes. It's incredible to see. I can hear Audrey, Audrey coming through. I'm just going to try and reposition. And just let them know that the hyenas have moved around a little bit. I can't see any individuals towards the den. Let's do another Austin Powers style turn. Now keeping us busy this morning. why it's so important to be able to sit and observe an active den site. You get so much insight into the way that the hyena interact with each other. Now I've mentioned before that I think spotted hyenas are my favorite predator out here. And I've got a couple of reasons for that. One is their curiosity, but the other is their incredible intelligence that they show in terms of problem solving and communication. In that respect, they really are quite phenomenal. I'm just going to once again get hold of Aubrey and let him know. Yeah, Aubrey, just to let you know, just as you arrived, they've started getting mobile northwest. I'm going to try and stay with most of them, but there was the youngest Mapimpan at the den. Let's try and loop around and stay with them. Unfortunately, my game drive channel is not working terribly well, so I can't quite get through to Aubrey to let him know what's happening here. It's coming out as rather crackly. Try and loop around without driving over any baboon's tail either.
stop him for a moment. We've got one of the hyena cubs. Peering after the adults. I don't think they're going to go too far, but it is a very thick block. So if they go further in, then we might have to return to the den site and just wait for them to come back. They're at that age where they're ranging around, just exploring the area. These older ones, the little one will stick quite close to the den. All tucked away in quite thick vegetation. I think for the moment, let me try and reposition. While we do take that moment to reposition so I can get us a nice clear view of these adults lying down, let's head across and see what Scott's up to and I will catch up with you a little bit later. Welcome back everyone and sounds like you're having a wonderful sighting with Jamie at the Hyena Den. Let's hope she can keep up with them as they've moved off. But again, big well done to her for relocating on that den site. And now we can get back into the swing of things and work out who's who and what's what with that clan. It's so difficult to know who is who and who the alpha female is. We have our speculations and theories seem to think we know what's going on and then we lose track of the den side for for a couple of weeks and then it's difficult to keep our finger on the pulse anyway jamie's on it so that's good news i'm just checking there's a strange shape in a maruda tree kind of sitting upright and it's just these strange shapes that you need to look for when trying to spot animals let's see if i can move the vehicle forward a bit i don't think the going to have a good angle let's just try though you see the ruler that's at like 8.30 VM. It's to the right. Yeah, I don't think you can have a good angle from there. We'll have to move forward a bit. It's really the top there. You can see I can't get to a little gap. Oh, there it is. A little funny, strange shape. But it looks like it's just a branch poking out on the left of the marina tree and it's not what I was hoping it was, I was hoping it was a leopard sitting up there with a kill I'm still actually not convinced I know what it is then let's try and get a little bit closer and get to the bottom of this because I can't be entirely sure I know what it is just yet a lot of vegetation in the way, which is making it tricky. This is I can't get a clear view from the road. And uh, it's a branch. I can tell from this angle that it is a branch. So we are going to continue. Good news, two male cheetah have been found. They're not too far from our eastern boundary. So let's hope that they via west. They are on the move at the moment and they know they're north and kind of west. So there is a chance they could pop onto our property. And it's been quite some time since we have seen any cheetah. There are not nearly as many of them here as the lion and the leopard. So that's why I'm going to continue lurking around this eastern boundary in the hope that they pop up. There's been no further sign of any other animals here. That's not to say they're not around, it just means that I haven't seen any clues or footprints or tracks in the ground. What a beautiful misty morning it is. And I don't think we're going to have any trouble with drizzle or precipitation today, which is also good news. Little bats. 
absolutely awesome popping out of the silver cloth leaf. You could pull something like hundreds of tiny little LED bulbs glowing. Beautiful. And while we stopped looking at this fresh green growth, you can appreciate a lot of bird song. So the bush is alive this morning, and that's great news. But we're going to continue now, after that little break. And it's so useful to stop and appreciate the smaller things, because so often, while you stop looking at them, you get information as to what else may be going on out here. I made a prediction last night at the fireside chat that by the end of the week we would have had a wild dog sighting. And what well, I will do, see again because I can't even remember when last we saw a wild dog sighting. In May. As in May, all the packs that we did see intermittently had found some den sites in various properties surrounding Juma and quite far from Juma. So, I don't think we have seen them since they were dead, although we may have had one brief glimpse of them. A pack from the south of us that came up on towards the Arethusa airstrip. I think James had a sighting of them, but it was months back. And they're such wonderful animals to see and to follow. High action, high adrenaline sports, following wild dogs. They move incredibly quickly. So that's something we all need to get ready for. Three animals, twelve little pups, and three remaining adults from the pack of what was five. Oh, thank you. I'm sure I just saw something. Oh, I forgot to plug my earpiece back in. Quick click, quick click. We need to send you across to Jamie. See you shortly. Welcome back and there's been some interesting activity I actually haven't repositioned at the moment just because the hyena are running all around us it's actually quite difficult to pick a position that makes for a good visual now, just a few moments ago there was a little bit of cub bullying but they've disappeared off into the thick block to my right running around suckle there you go trying to get into mom there we can't they're just running around a lot and I'm not going to cause too much disturbance by trying to follow them but let's see if we can get a slightly clearer look at this mother and her cub suckling away in the early morning
stop here for the moment. It's very thick in there and there's a lot of monkey orange which makes quite a lot of noise when you drive over it. I don't want to disturb them in any way. Let's just listen to that cub making begging sounds. Can you hear those soft little whimpers? Chittering away. I think got what it wanted in the end, which is a chance to suckle. They are starting to get a little bit big. You can see struggling to get in there. I know it is tucked away behind some grass, but at this age, for these two twins, or these twins, sorry, not two twins, twins, at this size, only one of them can really suckle at a time, the other one's whoop, trying. That's definitely a begging sound. And as I said, only really one cub can have a chance to suckle at a time. The other one's lying down off to the right, waiting his or her turn. This is the one I think that is a male, just judging by how much smaller it is than its sibling. And if it is a male, then a lot of the time it's going to be outcompeted for access to mom. And you might even find that it's weaned a little bit sooner. Now, just on the subject of hyenas growing up and getting older, Kathy from Tennessee would like to know at what age do they start heading out on the hunt with the adults? And they're definitely still too young. At about around a year and a half, maybe, they reach sub-adult stage and they might be able to keep up with the adults. If they are males, then they're already going to stuff to start hunting for themselves because very soon they're going to become nomadic and independent from their clan and from their mothers. They get bullied to the point of leaving of their own accord. So for this little guy, if it is a little boy, which I suspect it is, he will be out of the clan a little bit sooner than his sister. Probably at about a year and a half to two. He'll start separating himself. But then for the cubs that are sticking with the clans for the females, They'll be heading out with their mothers at about a year and a half to two. Now the interesting thing about hyena clan dynamics is they don't all live at the den site. Only the cubs live at the den and the mothers of the cubs will come by to feed them obviously and to look after them. And then the rest of the clan will rotate through and visit but they'll split off. They're quite happy to go off on their own or in groups of twos or threes and patrol the clan's territory and spend nights apart, only whether really gathering around the den site or gathering around a large kill. Or, if there's an interloping group of hyena coming through, because the clans are territorial, then the rest of the clan will come together and fight them off. But it's not as simple as they have a home that everybody in the clan lives at. It's only really for the cubs and their mothers. They've settled down quite happily. I'm still looking around to see if I can see the other cubs anywhere around. I've mentioned that these guys, as spotted hyenas in general, are often misunderstood and seen as scavengers constantly, as dirty thieves. 
but in fact they are very effective hunters and Faro from Ontario in Canada would like to know whether they prefer old meat or would they prefer to hunt fresh meat for themselves and it's a little bit more complex than that in terms of whether or not us a hyena clan is predominantly scavenging or hunting depends on how many lions there are in the area and how many leopards and how many kills they are capable of stealing so it just is very dependent on both the lion um, the lion concentration as well as the type of habitat these guys are suited for long chases over open areas they've got incredible stamina in terms of hunting and hunts initiated versus successful kills they're probably one of the most efficient hunters out here they've got a 70 percent to 80 percent success rate whereas with lions a lot of the time especially for groups of just females that sits at around 20 to 40 percent so hyenas are much much more effective at hunts and completing them they don't have a preference if I'm honest they will kill and eat fresh meat or they will be able to utilize which is what makes them so cleverly adaptable they can utilize and consume bits of carcass that no other animal out here can so they're very very well adapted in that sense I have heard or I have read that hyenas sometimes have a preference for soaking kills in mud wallows or pools of water and getting the meat nice and soft and slightly rotten and nobody can really offer up an explanation as to why they do this it might be a way of keeping kills safe away from lions coming through to steal them and lions do it does work in reverse they will steal a kill from hyenas if they can so it might be a way of keeping their kills safe but nobody can really explain to me I've never discovered exactly why it is hyenas stash their kills in water but it definitely adds an extra level of aroma to a carcass if it's been soaked and marinated in muddy water and I once saw spotted hyenas drag a zebra foal that they had killed into a dam and they lay on top of it they didn't eat it they lay on top of it for a full day before they started eating it But in terms of preference, what makes these guys so well adapted is that they're not fussy. They're quite happy to consume whatever it is they can find. Oh, we've got this quite contented picture of the hyena cubs suckling and it's really really nice to see but we can see how almost ungainly that one particular cub looks while he's trying to suckle from his mother just in terms of sheer size now, Donna Hall you were wondering how long they suckle for and the interesting thing that I read about that is it's actually dependent on the rank of the female so the lowest ranking females will um, they will wean their cubs off the milk far earlier than the dominant ones so the higher ranking females their cubs will be drinking milk right up until just over a year possibly even up to a year and a half whereas the lower ranking ones will wean their cubs around possibly six months although that's quite early that's one of the earliest recorded cases all the way to about nine months old and the reason for that is that the dominant females within the group have the best access to the carcass they get the most nutrition and they do a lot of the time they put in the least amount of effort in terms of if they walk up to a carcass that's been dragged to the den the other hyena will immediately make space for them to have a moment to feed on it so in terms of pup or cub rearing the cubs who come from higher ranking mothers are much much better looked after than those of lower ranking mothers and the interesting thing about hyena dynamics is although that system sounds unfair it works out really well for them but not only that sometimes a matrial lineal line so the one group of females and her daughters it might start to get smaller and smaller maybe a couple of them have died maybe some of the cubs haven't survived to adulthood and it is a tough world out here 
And if that happens to the point that one of the lower ranking female lines is a little bit, consists of more hyenas, it's even possible to have a coup. So all of a sudden there'll be one massive fight from the lower ranking hyenas who just decide they've had enough of this and they rise up and they actually displace the higher ranking females. It doesn't often happen but it has been recorded to have happened. So really interesting, that's what makes them so fascinating. They're not bound by the set rules that you read about in books. There's all kinds of interesting exceptions to the rule. But at the moment, these hyenas lying here seem to be perfectly content. Nobody's moved a muscle, except for the little cub, to have a look at what we're doing. Not too sure where the rest of them went. They disappeared off into the thick block. And shame if this little one is a male, that he's probably spent his time being quite significantly bullied by his sister. But better to have two, to have a male and a female cub rather than two females, because with two female cubs, the fighting and the competition is incredibly intense. If he is a male, then he would automatically assume a slightly subservient stance. But cubs do have to be taught their role in life and their place in life. So although that bullying that we saw a little bit earlier of the cubs, I wouldn't call it bullying, but um, teaching of the cubs that happened earlier with some of the adults where they grabbed them and you heard those screams of begging sounds. Those are important lessons that they need to keep them within the clan hierarchy and to keep the clan functioning as it should. We have a question while well, we've got these wonderfully young cubs here and we've seen a couple of the older females coming through and Carol from New York welcome to the Sunrise Safari you would like to know how long hyenas live for and I know of individuals that have lived older females who've lived up to 16 years old or possibly even older I'm just double checking in my book to see what the longest one has ever been but I know from sort of between 13 to 16 would be considered quite old for a hyena. And I think that in terms of the females, the females will probably live longer than the males just because they are bigger, they have less conflict and they've got the protection of the rest of the clan. But yes, I'd say for a male probably averaging 10 to 13 years, females I knew of one that had reached 16, but I think that was an exception rather than the rule. I'm looking to see in my book if I've got the information. The only thing I've just read is that females may put on weight for 10 years. And that's why when you see an older female, they look so absolutely enormous. Although we can't see too clearly, apart from the one cubs filling its belly from mom, Maggie in Australia, welcome to the Sunset Safari. 
Oop, okay, Scott's got an interesting bird. Let's head across to him. Maggie, I'll get back to you later. Welcome back everyone and just in time. Just in the nick of time, you got to see this female, or sorry, male saddlebilled stork sawing a little catfish that it caught. Awesome! It's actually the first time I've ever been able to share a kill that these animals have made with you. So that's exciting stuff. The last time one of these saddlebilled stork caught a fish, a fish eagle swooped down and ruined the whole scene. The saddlebilled stork dropped the fish and it swam away to safety and the fish eagle and the saddlebilled stork both ended up empty beaked. That was a small catfish that it managed to catch. You may have just got a tiny glimpse of it. So I'm not too sure how much you did see. But I was playing around with it on the ground for a few moments before you got to us trying to position it correctly. They need to swallow the fish head first. Oh, here comes the fish eagle, Vian. Beautiful. Great camera work there. And you're a little bit late this time, Mr. Fish Eagle or Mrs. Fish Eagle. But I'm glad because it was out of this very same tree that it's perched in now that it flew down and disturbed the saddlebilled stalk on their last kill. Awesome stuff. Well, sounds like you guys are having a really interesting sighting with Jamie. So we won't keep you too long here. But let's take another look at the saddlebilled stalk. They're incredibly pretty birds. Almost prehistoric looking in my books. <clears throat> And after its last meal, I'm surprised it waded straight back into the water right now. I think it's waiting patiently for potentially another meal. It's probably factoring into its equation the fish eagle sitting nearby, which it knows is going to cause trouble for it. And that's why it appears to have slipped into go slow mode. Interestingly enough, the cheetah managed to successfully catch and kill a diker, small antelope, and between two male cheetahs, they'll probably not take too long to finish it. But it will certainly slow down their movements and the hope that they'll come, on, come onto our property this morning. So that's an update on the two male cheetah to the east of us on Torchwood. Some Franklin calling loudly off to our left. Well, good to hear that Rudy in California and Lady in Gala are both practicing some of the local dialects and they've said good morning to me. And good morning in the local Shitsonga language is Avushoni. And Khuyamora is also good morning, but in Afrikaans. And those are the two words they used to greet us this morning. And very happy to hear you are making an effort on the local language. If and when you guys do ever make it out here, you will blow the staff away if you know just a few words in the local language. So it's a good idea. And the local word for a bird is an inyoni, spelt N-Y-O-N-I, nyoni.
very good questions just come through from Donna on Twitter and she's interested to know how long do I think it will take for that poor catfish to die within the stomach of the saddle-billed stork? I don't have a clue Donna and it will be a difficult uh, procedure to, to work out but the digestive juices of the saddle-billed storks are incredibly powerful and that's why they can sol swallow their prey whole. So I'm guessing maybe five minutes or so it would take to kill that catfish within the, the very acidic stomach juices but hopefully less than that. Hard to say though and if anybody does know the answer to that question please feel free to share it with us. Like I say, I don't know how you'd actually be able to monitor or test how long it takes any given animal to die if it is swallowed alive because it would require some serious equipment strapped onto that bird. It is important to bear in mind that catfish are incredibly tough animals, especially these sharp teeth catfish that we get here. They do not die easily. You can take them out of water, they can breathe through regular lungs almost just like us as humans so they can breathe in pure oxygen without having to filter it over their gills. That they don't have, they actually don't have gills. Um, but yeah, very good point you raised but I sadly do not know how long it would take exactly. The fish eagle has just flown off. Let's see if the saddlebird stalk now just changes its mood and decides to continue doing a little bit of hunting. It was a considerable meal it just caught itself. And the majority of the catfish that remain in this puddle are large, about four to five feet in length. So far too big for the saddlebird stalk to swallow. And this puddle has been filled up ever so slightly from the little bit of rain that we've got so far this year and we can expect a lot more rain and this water hole will hopefully fill up. And Lily Fire is asking, since the little bit of rain we have received, have we noticed an influx in mosquitoes? And yes, Lily Fire, we are being attacked by the mosquitoes. They're here in their numbers and it's time for us to get the mosquito nets out to keep us free from mosquitoes at night otherwise you will literally be carried away by them. There's a large amount of them in this area. But thankfully the Anopheles mosquito which does carry the malaria is not very common in this area so we don't have to worry too much about malaria here. Even though your doctors will tell you this is a malaria area, um, having worked here for four and a half years, I know nobody that has contracted malaria in this reserve. And there may be one or two freak stories, but there typically is not too much here. And the only time I've got malaria is elsewhere in Africa, Mozambique, Tanzania, and Kenya. So, they, they, I mean, it all depends on whereabouts you go in any given country, but thankfully we don't have that very, very dust, nasty malaria disease. It makes you so weak and ill, you cannot believe so. I wouldn't wish anybody got malaria, even my worst enemy. It's a very, very nasty sickness to get. I remember feeling like it was the end of my time here on the planet whilst working out at a very remote camp in Tanzania in the Katavi National Park. I had to actually send an airplane from a very wonderful company called Flying Doctors and basically anyone who works out in the bush in East Africa or any tourist that actually comes on holiday in East Africa it's a, is obliged and almost forced to buy into the Flying Doctors scheme and for a very small fee you get covered if anything happens to you out in these remote camps and they'll send out a plane to connect you and that's what happened in my case it was a four and a half hour flight that they had to send a grand caravan from Nairobi, the capital of Kenya, deep into the southern reaches of Tanzania, where they collected me. 
and flew me back in a flying ambulance and they raced me into the ICU in the Aga Khan hospital in Nairobi just in time to do what they needed to do to get me back to life but very nasty memories of that sickness it was well worth getting it though because the places that I got to travel and explore in Tanzania where I contracted the malaria were some of the most beautiful places I think on the planet or at least that I've seen so far not too sure what to do, I did have some male leopard tracks um, but the roads are so hard at the moment and I'm not feeling too confident in tracking it down and the tracks we're heading in the direction that we had come from and it's not an easy area to work around Central Road and Yala Road North hard to say which leopard it was, it looked like a large male but it could have been a female you know, male Liam's just spotted some wild eggs, eagles just landed up on their nest but it isn't for many thousands of kilometers away Try and get us into a good spot. So these are intra-African migrants. They don't leave Africa during our winter. But they still head far north, north of the equator. And like I said, isn't it absolutely wonderful that they come back to the same very tree that they nested in last year. These two are easy to distinguish from other Wilbergs because it's a pair of two pale forms. Which is not hugely common. Usually you get a mix of paler form. You can see the individual in the nest, hard to say which is male or female, but one of them is busy doing some housekeeping. And you can see they've actually picked some fresher leaves or branches which actually still have leaves on them. That looks like it could be a guari branch to lay at the bottom of the nest where they will be laying their eggs shortly. The bird that we could hear calling off in the distance there was a grey-headed bush shrike, an incredibly pretty bird, cousin of the self-arrested bush shrike. I've actually just heard the self-arrested bush shrike calling now. But it's a little bit off in the distance. Good morning, Wendy. Um, good to have you on board. Wendy would like to further discuss malaria and would like to know whether or not it's true that if you have got malaria once, it could recur at any stage of your life. And that is true, Wendy, but it only pertains to certain strains of malaria. You get many different types of malaria, and the one that I got. Um, is not a recurring one if killed properly and that was the problem that I faced I got malaria for the first time and I was treated in a small town called Mwanza on the banks of Lake Victoria in Tanzania and the hospital that I was in was, was very very basic I had to send the housekeeper who came in and kind of cleaned the ward every morning you'd give her money to go and buy you food and water off the street 
So that was the kind of hospital that I was in. They didn't provide you with food or even water. And I mean, the doctors did a great job in treating me, but I guess they failed in that they did not kill the disease entirely. And two weeks after leaving, thinking I was better, it kicked in again. So then I got flown to Nairobi and they treated it properly and killed it off once and for all and then there were no problems. So that was an example of where people may get confused. It didn't actually recur, it just wasn't killed properly. So certain malaria strains can be completely terminated, but others may come back to haunt you for the rest of your life. So it all depends on where you contract it and which specific strain you contract. Interestingly, the one that is the easiest to treat is the cerebral one, which is the one that I got. So, even though it's the one that kills most people in Africa, it is the easiest one to treat. So it responds the best to treatments. Whereas other less dangerous ones may respond less well to the treatment, but they are less deadly. I found it remarkable just how quickly I went from feeling okay to feeling like I literally was going to die. Your body loses power at such a dramatic rate that I can understand how and why you do get these horror stories of people dying of malaria, especially in this day and age. A lot of the time it's because of traveling, so people travel abo abroad and then go back to their home country where they are not used to treating malaria and their doctors make the mistake of not inquiring as to whether they've been in malaria areas and therefore don't assume that their patients could have malaria and are therefore clueless as to how to treat what to treat so make sure if you are ever in a malaria ever in a malaria area and you do feel sick thereafter that you tell your doctor that because I have heard one or two horror stories of people who would have had the financial and medical support needed to fix the disease, but simply through bad luck, they uh, didn't work out what was what before the damage was too late. But I think we should get off the gloomy topic of malaria as it's sending cold shivers down my spine just thinking about the state I was in. Ugh.